Okay, welcome everyone. It's my pleasure to be co-presenting here with Doug Hurd from Cisco. And uh, before we get started, Doug, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Douglas Hurd. I work with the Cisco Security uh, Business Unit. Uh, came on board at Cisco several years ago through the acquisition of Sourcefire. I'm, I work in a strategic alliance capacity. I spend most of my time talking to other security companies and helping them uh, integrate with Cisco and vice versa. Thank you, Doug. Um, my name is Sam Kumarsamy. I work in security product marketing at Infoblox. And uh, you know, just I want to take a step back and explain how Infoblox got into the security space. You know, our core competency has been in networking, especially from the DDI perspective, what we call as DNS, DHCP, and IP address management. That's been our strength. And so we provide core network services. And based out of that, uh, the fact that we have a majority market share in that space, about 52%, according to IDC, we're able to leverage the, the network as a core and provide actionable network <clears throat> intelligence. So we have over 8,000 customers that uh, we can leverage and we provide that actionable network intelligence. And what our customers have told us over a period of time is, hey, you provide the DDI infrastructure for us. Now, why don't you extend that and protect that infrastructure? So that's where we started focusing on DNS as it became a threat vector that is more and more prevalent because you know, people are using it to uh, do DNS-based uh, malware communications, especially with CNC sites, doing data exfiltration, and as well as DDoS attacks are happening through it. So that's how we got involved into the security space and we started developing products around it in order to protect our DDI infrastructure. So what we have done is taken the actionable network intelligence, the golden nuggets within our infrastructure and actually leveraged that and now we are offering actionable threat intelligence. So that's how we got into that space. And what we did initially was to, uh, you know, we, we used a third party vendor in order to provide the threat intelligence and then Early part of last year, we actually acquired a company called IID based out of Tacoma in Washington state. And now we have fully integrated them so that now we started offering our own threat intelligence uh, uh, as a service and we apply it to our products. And therefore, you know, we are extending the actionable network intelligence now into actionable threat intelligence. A quick uh, question for you, Doug. Um, sure. How did you guys get into the whole threat intelligence space? And then I will lead into what is, what do you mean by threat intelligence? Sure. Um, so we have a pretty broad portfolio at Cisco of, of security products from a number of acquisitions. And uh, many of these products require uh, threat intelligence in order to stay current, right? I mean, many of these products are detection technologies that um, are constantly being updated, right? So we, we live in this threat intelligence oriented product portfolio. We have a research organization that's constantly updating uh, different types of information so that our products remain effective. Um, but we get a lot of uh, requests from customers to extend our threat intelligence capabilities uh, into some of the other industry areas. So that's that's kind of how we, we came to partner. Yeah, no, great uh, point well taken. So let me start by saying, you know, explaining to the audience here, what, what do we mean by threat intelligence, right? It's kind of uh, the buzzword that's used nowadays. So I want to kind of use the VC parlance and kind mm -hmm. of describe it in a single sentence. So if you really look at it, it's basically a, a stream of data right, that's providing information about the current and poten potential threats that affect an organization's security. So if you double click on that, what I actually mean is we are taking like reputation based data, like the malicious IP addresses, right, URLs, domain names and host names. And we, this, this feed can be provided not only by third party vendors, but there's government agencies sharing that information because you know, obviously we all have to collaborate in order to stop the bad guys, right? Because the vendors nowadays are realizing no single vendor can provide the complete security solution for, for 
for our customers, right? There needs to be this cooperation, the sharing of information, not only from, from different vendors, but also from a government side. That's why the government, for example, the Department of Homeland uh, Security has shared their automated information sharing information, and they realized that they really need to share that with the commercial customers in order to stop the bad guys. So the more information you get, it's actually good. So the quality, uh, quantity is important, but at the same time, there needs to be a curation of that information so that you know, you're able to take the most relevant threats and apply it to the different organizations based on what is most relevant to them. So I know I kind of exceeded that one sentence as I started, but the idea is to say, hey, what do you mean by threat intelligence? Is that a fair explanation, uh, Doug, or how do you see it from the Cisco world? I, I, I think it is a good explanation. I mean, threat, you're right, threat intelligence is such a broad term. Um, I, like I, when people say threat intelligence, I know what they mean, but what I want to think is any type of information that helps a security product be effective. Um, we have a, a, a next generation firewall technology built on top of uh, SourceFire's IPS, next generation IPS product. So we've combined these technologies together and to an IPS user, um, threat intelligence could very well mean updates to the snort rules that they, that they deploy to detect. And that's, that's generally not used that way. Um, but threat intelligence, as you mentioned, it's a very broad term. Uh, to me, it's much broader uh, than, than just one particular type of data. But, but yeah, when I'm talking to people about uh, threat intelligence, it usually involves data that's being streamed and it's generally the latest data for some particular part of the security uh, landscape. Yeah, absolutely. So that takes us now to the topic of what I call as the challenges, right? So if threat intelligence is simple as taking the reputation-based you know, malicious IP addresses or domain names or URLs or the host names and just applying it to an organization, then you and I won't have our jobs, right? It's, if it's as simple as that, it's basically taking the threat feeds and applying it. Then, then the job is done automatically, right? But obviously that information needs to be curated, you know, make sure there are no false positives. And then as I mentioned previously, really putting it into various formats so that it's easily digestible by the security infrastructure and the ecosystem. But, right. but the important thing to remember here is, um, you know, one of the uh, studies that uh, Infoblox commissioned was with Ponemon Institute because we wanted to do a study of how is threat intelligence being adopted by enterprises, for example, right? Because as you know, it's a buzzword, you know, it's a very broad term. And what are the current pain points, for example, or the challenges of adoption of threat intelligence in enterprises? So there are, while the Ponemon uh, uh, study really indicated <clears throat> was three clear pointers on the difficulty in adoption. So the very first point was, you know, an organizational, from an organizational perspective, it is being applied in silos, for example. So the network team is taking some threat intelligence, maybe a subscription open source based or their own threat intelligence based on knowledge within their own uh, environment and applying it. And then the security team is not talking to them. You know, they operate what I call in silos and they don't talk to each other. And then when they try to apply it organization wide, it's not really effective. So that was number one point. And the number two point is also that there's not enough context, right? And when, when I say about, when I think about context is, yeah, that IP address is bad, but is it really bad today? Is it really, you know, if, if I stop that particular so-called malware IP address that is known for CNC sites, it's not giving me enough context to say that malware is bad, but it's actually exfiltrating data, for example. So just because a malware infects your company, is it the most critical malware that I need to block, right? Maybe I just need to monitor it. So context is the second point that companies said was difficult. They don't trust it because there's not enough context to it. And third is the inability to actually prioritize it by category. What I mean by category is double clicking on that particular, you know, while it's important to categorize whether that particular, uh, 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 you know, the IP address is malware based, you know, when you double click, is it coming from a CN known CNC sites, command and control sites? 
and then double clicking on that further from a property perspective to say, hey, is it actually rabbit malware? Then I know it is the most critical one that I need to stop, right? So that kind of detailed context as well as prioritization is not really being provided by today's suppliers of this reputation-based uh, malicious sites, right? Whether it's an IP address or domain name or URL, URL address. So it's very important to look at it from a context and prioritization perspective. And these are really the challenges today as pointed by the third party study that we did by Ponemon Institute. Any insights you want to share in addition to what I shared from a Cisco perspective, Doug? Sure, sure. Um, I can relate to what you're talking about here, but from a, a slightly different kind of technical perspective. Yeah. Um, you know, we have uh, customers using our network security technology. Um, we have detection, as I mentioned, things like, like Snort, our IDS engine. We have malware detection. Uh, we have a firewall rules engine that allows you to deploy all these different types of policy elements and collect all this kinds of data. Now, what customers have asked us for for a long time is the ability to prioritize our data, not just on how we build our technology to prioritize the data and you know, leveraging the attributes that we think are important from a prioritization point of view, but they wanna prioritize our data in correlation with your data. And that is the case more and more in some of the partnering discussions and some of the customer discussions we have. You know, we know that if a customer used every, every security product we have in our portfolio, and I'm talking about a big enterprise here, I'm not yeah. talking small companies, but, but you know, medium and big companies, they're gonna use something like 20 to 40 other security products. So even if they bought everything we have, they're still using tons of other products, which means they're dealing with lots of different sources of data, lots of different sources potentially of, of threat intelligence, and they wanna be able to dis distill some of this stuff to create, the, to prioritize the way that they want it, not the way that we want it necessarily. And you know, they, might, they, they might get data from so many different sources, they, want it, they, they need a way to organize it. So what we're trying to do is make it possible for our customers to combine technologies that they want to combine so that the data they see is that relatively, maybe that relatively small amount of critical security events versus all the noise that all these different security technologies can generate. Absolutely. You hit the nail on the head. And that takes us to the subject of what are some of the threat intelligence best practices, right? So what, what can we do? Because customers have said, you know, the adoption is not the greatest according to the uh, Ponemon Institute. It's certainly improved over the past two years, but it's still below 50% for all the reasons that I stated. You know, there's confusion, there is too much data. You know, they need help. They need help in filtering that data. And as you pointed out, is really applying that critical data or threat intelligence, which has been validated, curated, perhaps in a central location, right? You want to centralize all of that as much as possible, accept feeds from various sources, right? And filter it very specific for that organization. And in addition to that, is to distribute in various formats, as you mentioned, to be digestible by the different products, right? From different vendors. And that's where I think Infoblox uh, comes from with our product. You know, we have a product called Active Trust, and that is that need to actually filter that information, providing the context and prioritization that is required, maybe perhaps a threat investigation tool that will add, that can actually add context. Where is that IP address coming from? Is it coming from a rogue nation? Yes. Is this a known hacker? Because you can trace it back to an IP address. Then you apply that in terms for prioritization. It's absolutely critical then to say, hey, this particular threat, and for all the reasons I also mentioned in terms of categorization that you can get down to, is it a particular malware coming from a known CNC site? Is it rabbit malware, for example? That level of detail, you really need curation. And that's where, just from an Infoblox perspective, and I'll let you talk about the Cisco next, is that that level of intelligence is what we provide. And we have a cyber threat intelligence unit based out of Tacoma from the company that we acquired that is providing that human element where we are able to filter that information, provide about 20 different classes and about 300 plus properties in terms of really providing that 
context through prioritization. So that's where we are able to apply. And the fact is we supply this threat intelligence in various formats through our API. So for example, we can put it in Ceph format, we can put it in CSV format, we can put it in JSON format, for example, Stix <clears throat> format, which you're gonna talk about because that's apl applicable to your Cisco threat intelligence director. And also, you know, in various other formats, for example, the RPZ format or the response policy zones to be applied to the DNS firewalls, for example. And so that is very important that you're able to provide this best in class. And the idea is not to be specific to a vendor, but we believe in having an open, flexible platform that can be applicable to all third party vendors. So we want to provide this ecosystem integration and make it as easy as possible for our customers. So that is a win-win from an organizational perspective, because this threat intelligence that is prioritized will help improve the security posture, as well as the situational awareness of companies. Doug. Yeah, so we, we um, you mentioned STIC. So our firepower platform um, is very specific about the type of third party threat intelligence that it can digest. Um, at least with this particular uh, integration point on our platform, which is designed specifically for um, a threat intelligence feed that comes in over time and is updated regularly. So we're able to import this data and bring it in on a continuous basis. And we call it up, we, we, we say that we operationalize the data, which is kind of fancy speak for we're adding uh, lists and constantly updating lists of things that we want to detect and block right down on the wire on our devices, whether it's an internal uh, device uh, dividing up different parts of the network and protecting the different, uh, different levels of trust within the organization or whether it's a firewall at the perimeter and it's, it's uh, blocking a lot of inbound, outbound, uh, internet-based stuff. We allow our customers to very quickly deploy this, the latest stuff and they're instantly in a position to take advantage of your research uh, by virtue of pushing it through our, our Cisco Threat Intelligence Director. Uh, we've, it, it's, what CTID is, it's, my, the product managers always insisted that I never refer to it as a tip, as a, you know, a threat intelligence platform. Um, and I, I get where he's coming from. It really isn't about normalizing multiple sets of threat intel, although we can collect, in addition to your data, we can collect some of the free open source, some of the freely available feeds. As long as it adheres to the STICS format, um, we should be able to bring that data in. Um, and that just means our customers can now look at our, specifically the firepower event data, and have attribution as to why something was blocked down to uh, inflow blocks data as opposed to a firewall rule just blocking a connection. So it's really not about normalizing multiple sets of threat intel. It's about giving our customers the ability to apply one or more, any, any reasonable number of sources of threat intelligence and bake it into their policy um, so, that, so that they can either, maybe they're just monitoring, they wanna just get alerts when uh, things from your threat intelligence list are seen or observed, connections to those things are observed, or maybe they want to block it. Um, that's entirely down to the user, but it's, it's the ability to enrich firepower data with your data. Yeah, so, so th that, you make an excellent point, and that brings us to the next stage where do we actually have the integration today between, uh, uh, between our threat intelligence tide as well as Cisco Threat Intelligence Director. And at this point, I want to actually share a slide that actually shows that integration and you can talk to it, uh, if you will, Doug, because you, you sure. are the one who actually went through this integration. You have the snapshot within Cisco Threat Intelligence. So for our, yeah. uh, so for our uh, audience right. here, you want to talk a little bit about how this happens. Okay. so. Um, Cisco Threat Intelligence Director is referred to sometimes as a product, but it's really not a product. It's a capability or a powerful feature set that's included with the Firepower Management Center. Firepower Management Center is our command and control platform where we push policy and, and, and other uh, system-related information down to a deployment of, could be a couple or it could be a couple hundred devices deployed around the company or around the world. And we also pull back from all of these devices, uh, telemetry, event data, information about 
what's being seen on the network, what's being detected, what's being blocked on our, on our firewall, on our intrusion detection, intrusion prevention engine, on our malware detection engine, URL filtration, and so on. So um, Cisco Threat Intelligence Director uh, is a capability on that management platform that gives you an additional uh, way to task your various detection devices on the network with information that you want to detect and block against. So any customer that simply upgrades to our version 6.2.2 is now going to see this tab that you have here in your screenshot. The, the user will then configure uh, it to collect data from a specific source. They'll select the source, they'll put in their credentials because the, the assumption is they, they have uh, access to uh, in, InfoBlox data. They'll put in their credentials and apply it. And then from that point on, uh, we will go out and, and request updates on a frequent basis and then push those new bits of uh, that new threat intel you know, and new incremental detection now um, out to all of our networks in, in virtually real time. I mean, it's, it's almost instant. Well, it's, it's near real time, right? It's, you know, within a second or two, we've got all this stuff pushed down to all the devices. Now customers have the ability to continuously uh, detect and defend against the very latest things. And that's really what this is about. No, that's, you make a good point. So for the, for the folks there who say, hey, Cisco is such a large company, you know, and they have a, a, a big threat research team. So why partner with Infoblox? Well, it, nobody has a monopoly on threat intelligence. We, we have, if not the biggest, about the biggest uh, cybersecurity research team in, in, in the sort of corporate cybersecurity world, right? Um, but we collaborate with all kinds of other, uh, all kinds of other organizations, uh, other companies that we may even, we, we may even collaborate a little bit with companies who may even appear competitive to Cisco. There, there's, there uh, are all kinds of benefits to customers when the cybersecurity industry plays nice and works together uh, there are tons of common sources of information that us and all of our competitors gather data from. So nobody has a monopoly. Uh, and, you know, you have, to, you have to, in this business, you have to pick and choose those parts of the security challenge that you're going to tackle. And you have to be very good at them because nobody does it all. There is no one-stop shop in our business for product, be it endpoint or network-based or cloud-based. So there's certainly no one-stop shop for threat intelligence. And... We have lots of joint customers. They want our stuff to work together. The alternative is, or the, the best practice in the past has generally been, you know, pull this type of data into a SIM, and then the SIM can then look at event data from one product and event data from another product and deliver a report to the customer that says, you know, here's a correlation between the, the, what we detected and, and other information about perhaps the destination IP that this connection was being made to. Now that's still important and SIMs are still a critical part of our ecosystem, but by bringing this information down to our solution, we can actually block it, um, not just look at what we might have wanted to block later on. So there's a real security benefit in this type of direct integration right on our platform, but it's not at the expense of, of uh, SIMs or other products leveraging your threat intelligence at the same time in the same company. No, that uh, you you hit the nail on the head, and you know I like the uh, I like the marketing buzzword that you use called opera operation operationalization. Operate, yeah, operationalize. <laughs> even I don't even know if it's a real word. Struggle with it a bit, but you know. So well, I want to tech... <laughs> trying to summarize it in terms of for our business decision makers as well as technical decision makers, right? So. From a business decision maker perspective, what we have done through this integration between Tide, you know, the, the threat intelligence data exchange from, from InfoBlox, as well as with uh, the, the integration with the Cisco threat intelligence director, is actually provide, as I mentioned, you know, uh, uh, improve the security posture and the situational awareness because you're providing very relevant data. But if you drill down, double click for the technical decision maker, be it the SOC operational guy or the uh, security analyst, is you're, as you said, you're allowing them to block more threats or monitor more threats, which you, which you alluded to, as well as you know, you're reducing the number of events they need to look at because we are sending you that prioritized information that has been validated and curated to make sure it's relevant 
to Cisco and our joint customers, right? So it's basically a win-win situation. By partnering together, you're actually addressing the customer's pain point. It's not about competitiveness, it's about collaboration and partnership. I totally agree. I, we, we, we have 20 different APIs and integration ports, points in our portfolio. We work with about 150 different technology companies, and there are probably, that's out of the thousand or so that probably have some sort of existence within the security business today. Um, so we pick and choose our partners based on what gives our joint customers the most benefit. It's as simple as that. We, we believe in an open architecture uh, in, in as much as it's possible so that our stuff works well uh, when it's sold into an environment that has 20 or 30 or 40 other incumbent technologies. Or if a customer makes a major investment in Cisco security, we want them to be able to uh, go and shop other complementary security technologies, knowing that we're going to work together with those so that they ultimately, if they get better security uh, or they're able to more quickly resolve critical security events or lower TCO through automation, which, you know, there's some automation here that we're doing. Mm -hmm. We're automatically applying InfoBlox data to the policy on our devices that are detecting and blocking things, right? So that's a time saver for customers. So if we can deliver those sort of benefits uh, with a partner, that's when we decide that it makes sense to work with that particular partner. Absolutely. So, so what do you think are the next steps in terms of evaluation? So if, if um, in terms of, you know, if you, have a, if you have a joint customer that has Cisco Threat Intelligence Director, would you recommend um, Infoblox is tied to integrate that to enhance the threat intelligence and remediate threats faster? Well, our, our platform is ready to collect data in a sticks format uh, from Infoblox. So if a customer is evaluating firepower and they want to evaluate um, our threat intelligence director capability, there's, there's nothing stopping them from doing that. If they already own our product, and they're considering uh, leveraging a, a threat intel feed like yours, I presume they can come to InfoBlox and request, a, request an evaluation and be on their way. Okay, absolutely. So, so some of the next steps that I, I, I absolutely recommend is to, you know, for the existing DDI customers who also have Cisco, um, you know, they're a Cisco-based network environment, obviously Cisco being a leader in the networking space, they can certainly evaluate our product. By the way, Tide is part of our product, you know, on-premise product called Active Trust, which, which actually bundles with the DNS firewall and on-premise DNS firewall, the threat intelligence, as well as the threat investigation tool. So that is something that, you know, our audience, the partners, our customers, our prospective customers can really evaluate that for, for 30 days and test it with the Cisco Threat Intelligence Director. And as Doug just pointed out, today we have that integration that is available and we also have uh, an, a deployment guide as well that's available on InfoBlox site. So I think it's important that they look at it, share that information, and uh, you can be up and running testing the product. Any final thoughts on it? Uh, uh, just, I think it's, uh, I appreciate people taking the time to, to listen to what we have to say. Um, uh, we are, as I mentioned before, we are committed to third party partnerships like, such as this one. And, uh, I welcome any input that any customers or prospects have about how we can make our products more effective through collaboration, uh, with, with third parties. And, uh, that, that I think is, um, that, that wraps it up for me. Okay. Doug, I appreciate your time very much. And, you know, as you know, you know, our integration is not just at security side, but we also have integration on the ACI side with our networking product. So we regard Cisco as a strategic partner. So for the audience out there, understand that we have several partnerships to learn more about it. You know, you can go to the InfoBlox partnership website, as well as to the Cisco uh, uh, partnership website to, to get more information on about 11 integrations of which two are in security. And this is the latest integration between our threat intelligence and Cisco threat intelligence director. Thank you very much for your time. And until next time, perhaps we can do a webinar on, on another product, uh, Doug, sooner rather than sure. later.
Yeah, thank you. Always, always willing to do it. Okay, thank you very much for your time. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Sam. Thank you.